Today I want to begin a brand new series out of the book of Revelation, and we're going to look into a study entitled, What are the Seven Seals in the book of Revelation? And these are found in the sixth chapter, although we do have some background remarks that we'll be studying in chapters 4 and 5. But we're beginning a series, and I think I'll be able to do this in three parts. And today will be part one. What are the seven seals in the book of Revelation? And let's begin, if you have your Bible, uh, by going into Revelation chapter 6. And Revelation chapter 6 is only 17 verses long. And so let's take the time, since we're going to be studying that sixth chapter in this Bible study, uh, to read it in its entirety. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. As I watched, the Lamb broke the first of the seven seals on the scroll. Then I heard one of the four living beings say with a voice like thunder, Come. I looked up and saw a white horse standing there. Its rider carried a bow, and a crown was placed on his head. He rode out to win many battles and gain the victory. When the lamb broke the second seal, I heard the second living being say, Come. Then another horse appeared, a red one. Its rider was given a mighty sword and the authority to take peace from the earth. And there was war and slaughter everywhere. When the Lamb broke the third seal, I heard the third living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice from among the four living beings say, A loaf of wheat bread or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. And don't waste the olive oil and wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the fourth living being say, Come. I looked up and saw a horse whose color was pale green. Its rider was named Death, and his companion was the grave. These two were given authority over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and famine and disease and wild animals. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred for the word of God and for being faithful in their testimony. <clears throat> they shouted to the Lord and said, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge the people who belong to this world and avenge our blood for what they have done to us? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And they were told to rest a little longer until the full number of their brothers and sisters, their fellow servants of Jesus who were to be martyred, had joined them. I watched as the Lamb broke the sixth seal. And there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all of the mountains and islands were moved from their places. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person all hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one 
who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to survive? What a unique question in Revelation chapter 6 in the last verse, verse 17 on the subject of the seals and the seven seals of the book of Revelation, who is able to survive? As we begin this Bible study, let's take a moment to pray together. Father, we humble our hearts once again in your holy presence and before this audience of people, and we pray that by the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit, who is the perfect tutor from heaven, given to lead us and guide us in all truth, that you would indeed lead us in the ways of the Lord today and in the words of the Lord today. Thank you for this incredible book in the Bible called Revelation and for all of the promises and prophecies and the foretelling of the future. You have provided a blessed hope for all who know its content. And as we are now living in the final moments of human history, I pray above all that every single life and listener would live ready to meet the Lord every day. As I so often say, there is nothing more important in all of the world than being able to lay your head to the pillow at the end of every day and know that your heart is right with God and that you'd be ready to go. Since the rapture of the church is the next major prophetic event, and because it is signless, and no man knows the day nor the hour, I pray that by the Holy Spirit you would motivate us to live in a way that is pleasing in your eyes. And I pray for those that might be listening to this Bible teaching today who do not have peace with God or wonder where they stand. I ask that when the invitation is given at the end of this time together, that you would give them the faith and the courage to do what they ought to do, to turn from sin and turn to Christ. Now by the Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. And we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. As you might imagine in 40 plus years of ministry and preaching on eschatology and the book of Revelation and Daniel and end time events and so on, there are always multiple questions that uh, come my way. I don't in any way uh, define myself as a scholar of eschatology, but I have studied it for over 40 years and continue to study it. And if I don't have an answer, I always promise and pledge to you that I'll do my best to give you an answer. And I so many times, and I hope this always comes across in the proper attitude, but I boldly ask you for permission to be a trusted voice in understanding Bible prophecy and the end times and the other matters of biblical doctrine. I pledge to you that I'll always do my best to bring you the truth of the Bible and to dig in its pages until the gold nuggets of God's perfect truth are clear, and then pray for me that God will help me and anoint me and strengthen me, mind, body, and spirit, to make it clear. Because our audience is oftentimes comprised of young boys and girls who are trying to learn Bible prophecy many times in our Lost Lamb events. I see in the front rows teenagers, young people, college-age students, sitting with Bibles and notebooks or uh, electronic devices and iPads and so on, fervently taking notes because they're hungry to know what God has said about the future. So as we begin today, let me encourage you that we live in a darkening hour in which the stage for the arrival of the Antichrist and the one world government and the one world monetary system and the one world religion, the one world military power that will enforce it and the revelation of that Antichrist, that one world leader, though we are seeing all of the signs blatantly pointing in that direction, we have a hope that we soon shall be taken 
For the Bible clearly teaches in Bible prophecy that God saves His wrath for His enemies. Most of the questions that I have received through the years on the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, I would say 90% of those questions could all be put into one file. And that file would be, what are the seals or what are the seven seals in the book of Revelation and what do they mean? And so with that question at the foundation of this series, we're going to begin addressing what are the seven seals in the book of Revelation. As we begin another series in the book of Revelation, don't ever forget what I've taught you out of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. And if you're new to our ministry, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 is God's promised blessing to every student of Bible prophecy. The fact that you take time to be with us and to follow us and I'm perfectly aware of the fact because of the technology and the platforms that are used for distributing information in this modern hour in which we live that people take time as their schedule allows. Some listen to it live. Some listen to it on a podcast, our podcast channel, as they're traveling. I have some who say, I keep your podcast on when I'm at work and have free time to listen or during lunch breaks or they watch the videos or the archives or they go to the YouTube channel or they find the Facebook video teachings archived. And it really is wonderful that people have an opportunity to study the Bible in their own way and in their own time. Always study the Bible with a fresh mind. And as you're listening to this series, remember the blessing of Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Uh, if you have your Bible, the scripture uh, tells us in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 that God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church. Then it goes on to say, and he blesses all who listen to it and obey it for the time is near. The blessing of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3 is what I sometimes refer to as triune or three-part in its nature. God blesses. Now there's the guarantee. If God says He's going to bless and you follow what He has stated, are the rules for that blessing or the covenant core values of that blessing, then that blessing is always guaranteed. It doesn't work half the time or 75% of the time. The fact that you are now listening to the book of Revelation, provided you understand the blessing, guarantees. Now, I don't know what the blessing is, as I say so many times as people ask. I'm not God. God has innumerable ways of blessing you. He knows what you need. He knows what you need more than you know what you need. But the triune part of Revelation 1-3 those who read it, those who listen to it, and those who obey it. Don't ever forget the importance of not only being a hearer of the Word of God, but being a doer of the Word of God as well. Of the 66 books that are contained in the Bible, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament for a total of 66 of all of the 66 books in the Bible, only the book of Revelation, which is the last book of the Bible and of the New Testament, has this exclusive promise. No other book in the entirety of the Bible begins with this supernatural exclusive blessing that we find in Revelation chapter 1. That's why sometimes the book of Revelation has been referred to by scholars of eschatology as the blessing book, and I wholeheartedly believe that. If you're taking notes, let's begin by reminding you of the simple outline of the book of Revelation. 
because not only is the book of Revelation the only book in the Bible that contains the promise of a supernatural blessing, it is also the only book in the Bible that provides for us its own unique outline. And if you're wondering where that's found, the blessing is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3. The outline is in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 1 verse 19. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. And so there again is the three-part outline of the book of Revelation. Number one, the things which you have seen. Number two, the things that are now happening. And number three, the things which are to come. Now add to that outline, number one, the things which you have seen that is contained in chapter 1. The things which are now happening are contained in chapters 2 and 3. And the things which are to come are contained in chapters 4 all the way through the end of the book of Revelation, which is Revelation chapter 22. The things which you have seen, chapter 1. The things which are now happening, chapter 2 and 3, and the things that are going to happen, chapters 4 through 22. The church is mentioned 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation, uh, from the Greek ecclesia, 19 times from the original text translated in our modern English Bible is the word church. In those first three chapters, the church is recorded 19 times. It is never mentioned again after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 until the closing remarks of Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. Now I point that out to you if you're a new follower of this ministry and maybe a new believer and just beginning to study the book of Revelation, I put an emphasis upon that and an exclamation point because I want you to remember as you study the book of Revelation that there is no mention of the church from Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 all the way until Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. And one has to ask the obvious question. Why is the church not mentioned from Revelation chapter 3 verse 22 all the way until Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16? And the answer is because the church has already been raptured. The church is no longer on the earth beginning at Revelation chapter 4, all the way through the end of the book, there is simply a closing remark in Revelation 22 and 16, but the church has been raptured, and we'll study more about that in the days to come. In all of the chapters of wrath and judgment, beginning at chapter 4, in all of those chapters of wrath and judgment, the tribulation, the coming Antichrist, the mark of the beast, the desecration of the temple, uh, the battle of Armageddon, and so on. In all of those apocalyptic events found in Revelation 4 through Revelation uh, chapter 19, including the Great Tribulation, we have not one single reference or remark about the church. I find it becomes very difficult for people who try to teach, and there are many, who would try to teach that the church is going through the Great Tribulation. I find it very difficult to defend that position when there's not one single mention of the church 
Not one word of encouragement, not one word of wisdom, not one word of counsel on how to handle this time of great tribulation and wrath and judgment that's being poured out upon the earth. Not one word from God the Father to the Holy Church throughout all of that time. I find that very difficult uh, to pass any true test of proper biblical interpretation. So I want to make that clear as we begin this study on the seven seals of the book of Revelation chapter 6 that I have absolutely no doubt that the church is going to be raptured before the horrific events that begin in Revelation chapter 4 and take us all the way to the millennium in Revelation chapter 20. The church is not mentioned after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22 because the church has been raptured. If you'd like detailed study of that subject, I have teaching and it's available on all of our social media platforms. Look for a teaching entitled, Five Reasons Why the Church Will Not Go Through the Great Tribulation. If you've been exposed to teaching or you have questions on that subject, take the time to go to our series where we deal specifically on that. Five reasons why the church will not go through the Great Tribulation. Revelation chapter 4 actually begins with a reference to the rapture. As I've already taught you, the church is never mentioned after Revelation chapter 3 and verse 22. And chapter 4 actually begins with a reference uh, to the rapture. Let's go to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, Come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And so we have the absolute obvious parallels with the rapture texts that are found in the scripture and the Bible tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, stating that the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain after the sound of the trumpet will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, to be with Him, taken with Him into heaven. The Bible makes several references in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 that parallel and really I find no other answer other than Revelation 4 and verse 1 being an apparent reference to the rapture. Revelation 4 then takes us into scenes in heaven. Now listen very carefully, and especially those of you who like to take careful notes. And I trust that you do, because it'll be the only way that you take notes and have really good retention as well as notes to go back and to refresh your mind and memory from time to time. To understand the seals that are found in Revelation chapter 6, you must have at least a fundamental working knowledge of Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. Remember in the interpretation of Scripture, as we read the Bible... The first thing that we do as we're trying to understand the Bible and learn about the Bible is read first of all in its natural flow and see if God is being obvious in the natural reading and the natural chronology with which it was given to us, which I believe is how you approach the book of Revelation. And this is really not debated among most notable scholars the book of Revelation is a reading of chronology. It is not, uh, and though there are mysteries where it is identified in Revelation, called mysteries, things that have not yet been revealed, by and large, the way to approach the book of Revelation is with a natural reading, knowing that the events are in chronological order. 
So to understand the seals of Revelation chapter 6, we have to provide some background teaching for Revelation chapter 4 and 5 because the seals and the scroll have already been introduced in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. So as we begin in this series part 1 of the seven seals in the book of Revelation, let's do just a little homework on Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, and this will be a great help to you in better understanding chapter 6. Revelation 4 begins with a scene in heaven. As I've already showed you, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1 gives us a very clear, remarkable reference to the rapture of the church, all of the saints who were saved and right with Christ that were taken in the rapture, have been taken, and those who were not right, those who are living in rebellion and sin, are backslidden, are left behind for all of the wrath and the judgment and the apocalyptic events that will come to this earth. I pray that none of you that listen to me, nor your families, will be so foolish as to ignore the teaching of the Bible and be left behind. Live every day ready to meet the Lord. As you've heard me say multiple times, if you've followed me for any length of time, Bible prophecy is not given to scare us. Bible prophecy is given to prepare us. Look at Revelation chapter 4 and uh, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4 verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. And so Revelation chapter 4 begins with scenes in heaven that focus around worship. And the same flows into Revelation chapter 5 except that in Revelation chapter 5, we are still in heaven. And I say we, the author John, who wrote the book of Revelation, has been transported. And in chapters 4 and chapters 5, he is writing from the scene of heaven. He is writing from the perspective of heaven. And chapters 4 and 5 in heaven, John writes about worship, and in the fifth chapter, he begins with a scene in heaven where the scrolls are first revealed. This is why it's important to understand chapters 4 and 5 and some of the background information that I'll provide in the first teaching in this series so that you might better understand the sixth chapter. Let's go to Revelation chapter 5 uh, and verse 1. Revelation 5 and 1, then I saw a scroll. And so there it is. The scroll that we're going to be studying in Revelation chapter 6 and the seven seals on that scroll, the scroll has been introduced in this scene in heaven, chapters 4 and 5, but it is first mentioned in chapter 5 and verse 1. Then I saw a scroll in the right hand of the one who was sitting on the throne. There was writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll, and it was sealed with seven seals. So here we have the introduction of the seals, seven in number, that bind together the scroll that John in this scene in heaven, it's been given to him to see. So let's take some time to better understand uh, the scroll as well as the seven seals uh, because some background information upon this will be a great help to you. Uh, in the ancient world, uh, the sealing of legal documents was a common practice. Uh, we still in the 21st century a seal and properly validate documents. Uh, many, many times 
I have to do that. I currently serve as chairman of the board of North Point Bible College and Graduate School. Our graduation here was not long ago. I had to sit down and I had to personally sign every single diploma along with Dr. Arnett, the president of the institution. And there are legal documents that are oftentimes forwarded to me uh, on behalf of the school or on behalf of the attorney for the school, and they require my signature. This is something that began in ancient history and it has evolved with time, but having a legal, valid, official document there have always been proper, legitimate witnesses and their presence and their signature required to authenticate it. In the ancient world, the sealing of legal documents or wills had to be witnessed in person by several individuals. Those individuals had to be trustworthy. They were oftentimes in some type of position or rank or had some type of official status that allowed them to be a part of the official sealing of documents. And then after the document had been uh, properly authenticated, it was rolled up and then it was sealed usually with seven strong threads. And the seven threads were tied to keep the scroll from unrolling. It also uh, made the contents unreadable and private until the document was officially at the proper time revealed and rolled and sealed with seven threads and then some type of wax, uh, depending upon the culture. Uh, there was a mixture of clay, uh, but it was placed upon each knot. So seven strong threads sealed that scroll and then wax or some type of clay uh, molten was poured upon the knot and then the officials had a signet ring that symbolized their seat of authority and they would take their signet ring and they would press it into the wax or clay and then when it cooled and hardened, it had their mark. And if the seals were broken, then the document was not valid. According to the Roman law, wills and testaments had to have exactly seven legitimate authorized witnesses. And in the Bible, Revelation 6 speaks of seven seals on the scroll that John revealed to us in the fifth chapter. Other documents were also required to have an, uh, having seven seals included birth certificates and various contracts. Uh, I would like to point out to you though that it's interesting that the number seven is used in Revelation chapter six because if you're a student of the Bible, you're probably already aware of the fact that the number seven has great significance, not only in the Bible, but in the book of Revelation. Uh, the number seven speaks of the fullness and the perfection of God. The number seven in the Bible speaks of the fullness and the perfection of God. Now, when it came time to open up the scroll, the will, the document, only the individuals who had been present at the sealing of the document had the authority to open the document and they had to be present for it to be authenticated, not only when it was written and documented, but when it was opened and the contents, uh, sometimes an inheritance, to be revealed and read and applied, the same witnesses that sealed it, those same witnesses had to be present at the time of its opening. This provides what I believe to be uh, significant information on why the seven seals in chapter 5 of Revelation had to be broken before the scroll could be opened. 
The insight of the ancient scrolls also provides insight and a better understanding as to why John is found bitterly weeping in Revelation chapter 5. Let's go there. Revelation chapter 5 and go down to verses 2 through 4. The reason why John is bitterly weeping is because of his understanding as to the legal process of ancient scrolls. The seven witnesses weren't present. John probably didn't even know who the seven were who had sealed it. And of course, this is a type. The scroll is a type. But as John is witnessing it, it's very real to him. Let's read Revelation 5 verses 2 through 4. And I saw a strong angel who shouted with a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and read it. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. The seals had to be properly and legally removed and the scroll opened before the Lord Jesus Christ could inherit the kingdom that was being presented to him. So that is why John is so grieved and so passionate and found weeping. Because John, it seems, in reference in the book of Revelation, has a knowledge as to what this scroll represents. If you're taking notes, this is very important information in understanding the seven seals of the book of Revelation in the sixth chapter. The scroll represented a legal will. That legal will was written by the Heavenly Father. The scroll contained the promise of the inheritance of the eternal kingdom that belonged to His only Son, Jesus Christ. Very, very important to understand what the scroll represents in Revelation 5 and Revelation chapter 6. This scroll, this legal will and testament has been scribed by God the Father and it is the will that contains the inheritance of the eternal kingdom of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ. And John is bitterly weeping because he knows that the scroll represents an inheritance that belongs to Jesus, written by God the Father. But he, in his finite thinking, is broken because it seems no one is present to properly open up the seven seals. Uh, let's go to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I don't know why I keep closing my Bible. Revelation chapter 5 verses 4 and 5. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping. Look. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne, has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. It's in John and I believe the 16th chapter in verse 33 that the Bible says, In this world you will have tribulation." But be of good cheer, the words of Jesus, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Because Jesus Christ, as God's only begotten Son, went to the cross, and through His life, His death, His burial, 
his supernatural resurrection, his ascending to his proper place of authority at the right hand of God the Father. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the proper lineage of David. He is the one who has overcome the world and therefore is worthy to open up the scrolls and reveal God's purposes. As long as we're in chapter 5, go down to verse chapter 6, excuse me, verse 6 in chapter 5, Revelation 5, verses 6 through 13. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered, but it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings and among the 24 elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which represent the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they held gold bowls filled with incense which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne, and of the living beings and the elders, and they sang in mighty chorus, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea. They sang blessing and honor and glory and power belong to the one sitting on the throne and to the Lamb forever. Praise God. So now I think you have a better understanding before we begin to explain what the seven seals are in Revelation chapter 6, why it is so integral to understand Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. When we get to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, the scene now changes dramatically, to say the least. The scene in Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is a scene of worship in heaven. But in Revelation chapter 6, it switches to a scene of wrath on earth. And so Revelation 4 and 5, a scene of worship in heaven that transitions into Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1 as a scene of wrath upon the earth. John is transported, the author of the book of Revelation, John is transported from the glorious scenes in heaven and is quickly transported in this vision to the graphic scenes on earth and the opening of the seven seals and Christ is the one who is opening them. He has overcome the world through his life, death, burial, and resurrection and the shedding of his blood. He has become the only begotten and now as King of kings and Lord of lords, no one is worthy to open the scroll except Christ himself. The earth and all who remain on the earth after the rapture are about to enter into a period of apocalyptic judgments and the incredible wrath of God so severe that Jesus said if God the Father had not shortened the time, none would survive. 
Pay careful attention. Revelation chapter 6. And the scroll and the seven seals is the beginning of the great tribulation. Revelation chapter 6. Christ found worthy to open the scroll. Now takes us into the period of time in the book of Revelation that is called the Great Tribulation. We're going to conclude here today in part one, uh, as we're in this series, what are the seven seals in the book of Revelation? And in part two, we're going to pick up right here where we left off. I had to take you through four and five and provide for you the very, very significant background information, the historic information, uh, a better understanding of ancient scrolls and seals and legal procedures and witnesses before you would fully understand the sixth chapter. And so in part two, we're going to pick up right here at Revelation chapter 6 and verse 1, and we'll begin to explain and to define for you exactly what those seven seals are. In our conclusion today, one of the things that I trust you'll never forget is that the events in the book of Revelation are real. And they are happening now and will continue to happen exactly as God has prophesied. We are already witnessing the nations of this earth the godless leaders of this earth, the technologies of this earth, unless you're living off-grid with your head in the sand, what is going on in our world today, what we witness in the news today, what we are seeing in our own nation, and the quick fall of our own nation here in America, and the godless leadership that is propelling us into the agenda of the Antichrist system, all who follow this ministry and all who know this Bible and all who understand Bible prophecy, you are well aware of the fact of the path that we are on and where this path leads. And the next major prophetic event is the rapture of the church. This is the reason why I have dedicated my entire life to the preaching of the gospel and to the explanation of Bible prophecy and the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and First and Second Thessalonians and end time events and so on. Because it's happening. Many people ask me, when will you retire? I will never retire because this is a holy mission. How could I quit warning people, knowing what I know, that Christ is soon to come when thousands upon untold thousands around the world have yet to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I conclude by asking you a simple question. What if the rapture were to take place today? Would you be ready to meet the Lord? I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. I'm here as an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ to help you. If you're not sure that you'd be ready to meet the Lord why don't you pray with me today? You can repent of sin and receive Christ today in prayer. Right now, what hinders you from making your commitment to the Lord today? Will you pray with me? Right where you're at, no matter where it is, what time of day, what time of night, what nation of the world you may be listening, God will hear you if you pray from a sincere heart. Just pray this with me out loud and without shame. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I want to be ready to meet the Lord. As I watch this world and all of its chaos, I believe you're coming soon. Today I acknowledge my sin. You know everything and nothing is hidden from your eyes. I, in childlike faith, repent of sin and ask Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior. I receive salvation 
as the gift of God. And now according to your word, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm set free, I am a child of God, and I'll never be the same. For I vow I will live for you all the days of my life. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Lord Jesus. 